watched on Facebook or YouTube. We're glad you're tuning in and watching with us. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with our worship. We're going to start with How Great Thou Art. Let's all stand and sing along with us. Amen. So good to have you in the service tonight. My, we're in for a good time around the Word of God tonight. I'm so glad you could join in with us. Well, we're in for a treat tonight. Uh, Brother Jackson Gravely is going to come and share with us. He's part of our children's church, and I'm thankful for Sister Ann and what they do uh, every week in children's church, their faithfulness to the Word of God and faithfulness to uh, honor God in the teaching of our children. So you come on, Brother Jackson, and show us what you got. Amen. Amen. Hey, this is Jackson Gravely, and today I'm going to give you a verse. Psalm 71, 8. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. 
Wasn't that good? Amen. Brother Jackson Gravely, I'm so thankful for him. I'm telling you what a great blessing, what a great blessing he is. Amen. I love our children's church and love all of our kids. I'm telling you, they're a great blessing to our church. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us tonight. He knows what we stand in need of. Father, I want to thank you again for the privilege to worship you. Thankful, Lord, for all the many blessings on our lives. You've been so good to us in so many ways, and we have so much to praise you for. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, uh, Lord, to meet in your house. Uh, Lord, in your house, Lord, I know these are difficult days, and Lord, I pray, oh God, that you would uh, speak to hearts during this time, draw people to you during this time of sickness and affliction, pestilence, Lord. But I pray, oh Father, that you'd have your way. I, Lord, I know you have your way in the whirlwind. I know you got your way in this, and Lord, you're using this to draw people to you. And Lord, I pray for people that are indifferent sometime and don't want to. Uh, uh, Lord, just to honor you, but Lord, I pray that they would and come back to your house and do that which is right. Use this as a time of drawing people to you. Lord, I know you're able to do that. I pray, Lord, for those that are sick and shut in, unable to come. Lord, I thank you for this medium that we have to worship you this way. And thank you, Lord, that they're tuned in even tonight. And thank you, Lord, for our church and uh, those that are faithful to tune in and worship you by this way. Lord, I pray that this, this evening's worship service be a great time of blessing, encouragement to your people. Touch, Lord, those that may not know you, those that may be tuned in for the first time. Speak to their heart, Lord, and draw them close to you and save them, Lord, if they've never trusted you as personal saving. We'll thank you. We'll praise you for all that you do in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, just before our message, Brother Ricky Harris is going to preach for us tonight. Man, I'm telling you, it's going to be a good time. He always brings a good message right out of the Word of God. I want to share with you a, a story behind the song, and then we'll have this song, Count Your Blessings. And, of course, this is a song that was wrote uh, many years ago by Johnson Oakman, Johnson Oakman, Jr., of course, his dad was a uh, great man, a great uh, mercantile man, and he followed his dad after the Civil War. He uh, was born in New Jersey. 1897, he published a song entitled Count Your Blessings. And, of course, uh, he wanted to uh, uh, be used by God uh, in many ways, but, of course, he was compelled to stay in the mercantile business, and he did for many years. But he's... He was used by the Lord to uh, publish some books, publish some music, start a music school, and was used many, many years. He averaged uh, two, 200 hymns and gospel songs a year and uh, wrote over 5,000 songs during the course of his lifetime. Those included Higher Ground, No Not One, The Last Mile of the Way, and of course this song that we're going to feature tonight, Count Your Blessings. Now he wrote this song. I uh, was compelled to write this song, and uh, as I said uh, on Wednesday night, one Wednesday night, I was going to give you the background of this song. He felt compelled to write the words of this song as he was leading a youth uh, meeting and a youth school of music. He felt that the youth had somehow lost their uh, their emphasis or their encouragement toward the things of God. And as he was uh, reading and writing and thinking about the things he thought about uh, Martin Luther's table talk. And he thought about the greater God's gifts and works, the less we regard them. And that's so true so many times in our lives. You know, we've been blessed so much here in America that it seems like we just regard the blessing of God and take it so much for granted. And as a result of that, he got to thinking about the blessings of God and how we ought to count the blessings so much. We tend to exhibit a degree of thanksgiving in reverse of proportion to the amount of blessings we receive. A hungry man is most thankful or more thankful for a morsel of bread so many times than a rich man for a hearty, thankful a table of bountiful food. And yet uh, we are that way here in America. We've been blessed more probably so than the rest of the world, and yet we give thanks less than many of the world. And we ought not to be that way. We ought to take, pay close attention and count our blessings. Let's sing this old song together. And right after this song, Brother Ricky Harris will come and bring our message for this evening. Count your blessings.
Good evening. Welcome to Four Mile Baptist Church. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. I'll read the first eight verses, and then we'll go right into the message. And uh, you hear us prayerfully. Uh, buckle up and hold on, because we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So, in Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife, she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She again bare his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wrought, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrought? And why is thy countenance fallen? Listen to this now. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, we come to you right now. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, for the promises contained in your word. We thank you for the encouragement contained in your word. But we thank you for the warnings contained in your word too, Father. We, your word's plain. Your word's simple. And Father, just help us to hear it and take it with what you say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll bring you a message entitled Five Features of False Religion. Five Features of False Religion. Now we've uh, I, I thought about this a lot and prayed about it, and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today that claims to be the right way, and, and you've got to have some discernment to understand that it's not the right way. And I want to talk to you about that. We have a picture here of Cain. We have a picture here of Abel, and both of them came to God. Both of them brought an offering. Both of them brought a sacrifice. One of them was accepted. One of them wasn't. Now, I want to look at why. Cain's offering was not accepted. So let's look at it. A close examination of the era of Cain will give us at least five features or five characteristics of a false religion. Now these characteristics are, are contained here in Genesis chapter 4, but they hold true for the day, and I want to show you that. Satan's the father of all false religions. He always has a counterfeit or a substitute for God's way. The thing we need to understand tonight is Satan will have his way so close to the real way that it appears to be right when in fact indeed it's wrong. So we need to have some discernment and we need to be careful about what we're doing. We need to try everything by the word of God and we need to take the word of God at what the word of God says and not try to add to it or take away from it. So let's look at it. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, here's what the Bible says. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe least the light of the glorious gospel who is the image of God should shine unto them. So Satan's blinded their minds so they wouldn't believe. He's the God of this world. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15 says this, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, here listen to this now, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You see what he's saying here? It can look good, it can look real, and not be real. And we got to look at that. We got to take script. You know what? You know what they're doing today? And I'm going to get off this thing. I know him, and I got to hurry, but I want to show you something. They are rewriting Bibles today so they can edit out the stuff that they don't agree with. Listen, you don't rewrite the Bible to make things right. God said a long time ago, he, he gave us his word a long time ago, we need to take the word he gave us, live by it, and if it's right by God's standard, it's right. If it's wrong by God's standard, it's wrong. And it doesn't matter if I change the words, it's still right or wrong based on what God says. But let's go on. Satan can transform himself to appear as an angel of light. Can I tell you this? It's going to shock you, but I'm going to tell you this. When you turn your TV on on Sunday mornings and watch preachers, televangelists on the TV, not all of them are biblical. Not all of them are, are following God. They say they are, but not all of them are. 
Take the word of God. Try them. The Bible tells us to do that. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God. The very first thing I want to show you based on this scripture that's a characteristic of a false religion is we substitute reason for revelation. Reason for revelation. What's this? The only hint we have of a sacrifice up to this point in chapter 4 is recorded in Genesis 3.21 where it says, And unto Adam also and his wife did God make coats of skin, and he clothed them. So that hints to a sacrifice. Now, a lot of people want to argue that there's no sacrifice there. It doesn't say, but if you compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll find there had to be a sacrifice. Because it says at one place in Scripture, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Adam and Eve needed to be atoned for, so blood had to be shed. So there was a sacrifice made, and that's not recorded, but we know from reading Scripture there was. And watch this. I want to show you some more things that points to this. All right, we know Adam and Eve must have explained to their children the way of God. They knew the way of God. Hey, hey listen up, parents. Here's the thing. If you have kids, it is your responsibility to train your kids in the way of God. It is not the church's responsibility. It is not the school's responsibility. It's your responsibility. They ought to see God in the home. Mom and daddy ought to explain it to them. Now, the church will help. The school should help. But we live in a world today where they're trying to do away with God. i got to move on. Watch this. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, watch what it says. And in the process of time, if you study that out, that in the process of time is a statement that means at the end of the days, or it even means on the last day or the Sabbath day. So there was a point in time for them to make an offering. Now, it doesn't record it. Now, I'm not, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, on the Jewish calendar, today's the day of atonement. Is not, Brother Joel? It's kind of funny how God led me this way with it being the day of atonement. Now, I didn't know that when I started studying this. But what I'm trying to say is this. There was an appointed time for them to offer a sacrifice. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, let's read a little further. All right. He said there was an appointed time in the process of time. At the end of the days, it says Cain brought. Let me ask you something. Where did he bring it? There had to be an appointed place for Cain to come to to offer a sacrifice. So if you go over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 4, let me read it to you. You'll find there the Bible says that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice then Cain, let me find it. Abel offered a more sacri- uh, offered a more unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he had righteousness, God testifying of his gifts, and he being dead yet speaketh. So he offered by faith. So when he came to God at an appointed time, at an appointed place, it tells me he had some knowledge of what God expected for sacrifice. You know what Romans 10, 17 says? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So they must have had a revelation from God as to what they needed to offer. Abel followed the revelation. Cain did not. He substituted, listen to this, he substituted reason for revelation. Here was Cain's attitude. See, salvation focuses around three focal points. Number one, the word of God. Salvation is based solely upon this book and what this book says. Number two, the work of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, he he provided salvation for everybody that would come to him by faith and repent. And number three, the witness of the Spirit. So that's what salvation revolves around. Watch this. Cain's religion found a substitute for all three. It found a substitute for the word of God, for the work of Christ, and for the witness of the Spirit. What's this? It had a purely human scheme. Boy, this sounds just like our day today. Now listen to me. Hear me now. He tried to come to God his own way. I don't know how many times, Brother Joel's told me this, and I've had this happen to me. I don't know how many times people have talked to me, and I've talked to them, and here's what they've told me. Oh, preacher, me and God's got this thing worked out. No, you don't. 
You ain't got it worked out if you don't come God's way. Cain said the same thing. I got this worked out. I don't have to give a blood sacrifice. I'll just bring her the fruit of the ground. Watch what happens. Had a purely human scheme. It had a purely human sacrifice. He tried to come to God by another sacrifice. God's requirement was blood, blood sacrifice all through the scripture. It's by blood. Cain said, I'll offer the fruit of the ground. Do you know what happened? The ground had already been cursed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. God had already put a curse on the ground, and the curse or, or the ground represented the works, watch this, the works of Cain's hands. Cain was trying to get to God by his own personal works. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to upset some of you, and I don't want to upset you, but I want to be honest with you. If you're going anywhere that teaches you salvation is anything plus something else other than faith in Christ, if they tell you you've got to have faith in Christ plus works to be saved, you're in a false religion. You say, Brother Rick, you don't believe in works. No, I believe in works. But works come because we are saved, not to keep us saved. I am kept by the power of God through the Spirit of God. I don't have to have, I don't substitute reason for revelation. God's word said, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, but which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. So it ain't got anything to do with works. Point number two, and I know I'm hurrying, but I need to. You hang on. Not only does it substitute reason for revelation, it substitutes beauty for blood. You know, a lot of people today don't want to hear about a bloody religion. A lot of people today don't want to hear about the fact of a sacrifice. A lot of people today, listen to church, a lot of people today want to go to church to where they can feel good about the way they're living, even if they don't live like they should. If you can go to church living in sin and feel good about the way you're living, you're going to the wrong church. Listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy church. You come to church to worship God, but you cannot worship God with sin in your life. It's got to be pure before God, and then you can worship God. So watch this, substitute beauty for reality. Cain's offering was pleasing to the eye. It was probably fruits and flowers and herbs and spices and fragrances and stuff like that. But you know what? They pleased his eye, but God didn't approve. Why didn't God approve, Brother Rick? It didn't have any blood to it. Hebrews 9, 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. You take the blood out of the book, and you, we lose our salvation. Jesus died on the cross, shed his precious blood to purchase salvation for you and me, and it is only by the blood of Christ that I am covered from sin and saved for eternity. It's by his blood. Sin and devastation, it causes, it, it will never produce a pretty picture. Now, I know you see a lot of commercials on TV to where, Sin is made to look attractive, all right? You see all kind of commercials on TV where if you drink, you get the prettiest girl. It, it, but they don't show you a car wreck down the road where somebody's wrapped a car around a telephone pole because they're drinking and driving. It don't show you the devastation. Now watch this. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says this, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, least any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The word deceitfulness is real interesting. It's a word that means delusion. In the original language, here's what it means. It paints a pretty picture. Satan will paint you a pretty picture. You say, oh, Brother Rick, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. There is. If it wouldn't be pleasure, it wouldn't be attractive to anybody. But see what you got to learn to do by the grace of God, the Spirit of God, and the power of God is look beyond the picture to the reality of what will happen. Sin's devastating. Sin destroys. So don't fall for substituting blood for beauty because in reality, 
The most beautiful thing in the world is the blood of Christ shedding down the cross to purchase my salvation. He died for me, and all he wants me to do is live for him. So we substitute beauty for, for blood. We substitute reason for revelation. Number three, substitute trying for training or for trusting. You ever heard anybody say this? A preacher, I'm just doing the best I can. I'm going to tell you something. You may have heard it before. I'm going to tell you anyway. Salvation, true life in Jesus Christ is not a struggle. It is not a struggle to try to do what's right. It is a surrender to the person and work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you and allow him, yield yourself to him so he can live through you. It is a surrender of trust, not trying. So many false religions today are based on one thing, works. And I said this earlier. I'll say it again. If you're going somewhere that teaches you you've got to have works to get salvation, you're, you're in a false gospel. There is no works to the gospel of God. It's faith. By grace are you saved through faith. I want you to look at verse 6 and verse 7. All right, Cain's offered a sacrifice under God. God had no respect for it in verse 5. Cain was mad, and his countenance changed. God asked him, why are you mad? Why is your countenance changed? Watch verse 6. Cain talked with that, or, and the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wrought? God, listen, God, I love this. God will confront you in your sin. He went right to Cain, and he said, why are you mad? Cain brought an offering. It wasn't what God required. So God questioned him. Why are you mad? Why is your countenance fallen? Look what he said in verse 7. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? God basically told Cain, you may be mad and your face is changed toward me because I didn't accept your sacrifice. But if you do what I ask you to do, I'll accept it. So God turned it right back around and said, this is your fault. You rejected my way. Can I tell you something? A lot of folks today trying to go through all kind of stuff to get to God. So they can hang on to the life they're living and yet go to church and, and, and get to God. Can I tell you, you can't get to God that way. It's it's. He's got to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. You need to understand that. Cain refused to come God's way. Watch what else God told him. He said, if you do well, I'll accept you. If thou doest not well, sin life, that word life means crouches at the door. And there's a picture there in the Hebrew of a lion laying just outside the door to devour Cain when he walks out. And God was telling Cain here because he refused to come God's way, God was telling him, if you'll come the way I told you to, I'll accept you. If you don't, you're going to be destroyed by sin. Sin's destroying a lot of lives today because people refuse to come the way of God. Let's go on. He said, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin's waiting on you to overtake you. Look what else he said. And unto thee shall be his desire. If you yield to sin, you, you become a servant to sin. Hear what he's saying? To who you yield yourself, you become their servant. That's what he's saying. Then he goes on to say this. In verse 7, the last part of verse 7, and thou shalt rule over him. You know what he's saying? There's victory over sin if you come the way God's told you to come. But we want to substitute trying for trusting. We want to trust, substitute reason for revelation. We want to substitute beauty for blood. Here's something else we do. You can go, you, you look at any, let me give you this first. You can, get, you can look at any false religion or any religion today. You, you can measure religions, 
And I don't even like using the word religion because I don't have religion. I have salvation. Religion is something other. Salvation is new life in Christ. Religion is just something people yield themselves to. I'm not asking you to yield to a denomination. I'm not asking you to yield to a particular anybody other than the Lord Jesus Christ and turn your life over to him. Repent of your sins and trust him to be saved. You can go to a lot of denominations. There's so many of them. i got a bunch listed, and I'm not even going to name, name all of them. But you can go to a lot of denominations today, and you can look. If they tell you you need to have works to obtain salvation, you need to get out of there as quick as you can because you're in a false religion that does not provide salvation. Any religion that adds works to obtain salvation is a false religion. Works will be present in your life. And can I tell you this? If you say you've been saved and there are no works in your life, then there's a good chance you were not saved and you've been sold to deception. I'm afraid there's a lot of folks in churches today that have went through the motions, said a prayer, done all that stuff, come up, and thought they were saved when they never turned their life over to God. You know what salvation includes? God dealing with you, convicting you of your sins. You coming to God under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God and falling prostrate at God's feet and repenting of your sins. Repenting means you turn from your sins to God. Repenting of your sins, turning to God, and trusting Jesus to save you. Hey, if I die and go to hell, I'll die and go to hell trusting Jesus. And nothing else. We've got to move on. So we don't need to substitute trying for trusting. You just need to trust God. Point number four. This one's going to hurt. Cain substituted feelings for facts. Boy, I see a lot of people today caught up in feelings emotionalism. You say, Brother Rick, you don't believe in emotionalism? You don't believe in... Listen, I believe in feelings, and I'm going to tell you this right here. Salvation has feelings to it, but the feelings come after the fact of salvation, not before. And they don't validate my salvation. What validates my salvation is I came according to the Word of God under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, and I cried out to God for repentance... And God forgave me based on the word of God, the work of Christ, and the witness of the Spirit. Now, emotions come, and I have times I get happy. But I'm going to tell you, there's some days I get up and I don't feel saved. But according to the word of God, I'm saved. Not because of something I've done, but what Christ did on the cross for me over 2,000 years ago. Now, watch this. Cain felt good about his offering. I mean, he looked at the works of his hands. He brought the works of his hands before God, and, and he said, look what I've done. Look what, listen, think about it, this with me for a minute, and I'm almost done. If you and I could work our way to heaven, if there was something I could do to get me to heaven, if there was something you could do to get you to heaven, when you got to heaven, you'd look around, and here's what you'd say. Boy, look what I've done. Look what I've done. You know what's going to happen when we get to heaven? A lot of people won't talk about what they're going to do when they get to heaven. I can't give you anything better. I'll tell you what I think every one of us will do. I think we'll be bowed at the feet of Jesus. Every time, anywhere in Scripture, I find that a child of God gets in the presence of God, they hit their face before God. And I believe you and I are going to do the same thing. So I'm going to tell you something. You don't need to substitute. You don't need to depend on you. Your feelings will change. Facts are God's word never changes. God doesn't change. Watch this. Cain felt good about his offering. Cain was pleased with his offering. You ever talk to somebody and they say this? I ain't that bad preacher. I live a pretty good life. You need to go talk to them people over yonder. Them people over yonder are just wretched sinners. You know what? A person that is the best moral person in the world that has never, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, asked Jesus Christ to save them, is still as lost as the drunk on the street. He's still lost. And the, ones, the sad thing about this is, 
the ones hardest to reach are the good moral people because they don't see a need. Can I tell you something? You'll never go to the doctor till you see you're sick. So the best thing that could happen to me and you today if we're not where we need to be is see ourselves as sick before God and come to God in prayer confessing our sins and asking God to save us. Watch this. Cain didn't feel he needed a blood sacrifice. Well, I don't need all that stuff. Had somebody say one time, well, can't we just preach the gospel? Not here. Not here at this church. Been years ago now. Can't we just preach the gospel and leave all this blood and all this gore and all this stuff out? You can preach and leave it all out, but you can't preach the gospel and leave it all out. Listen, I'm going to show you something. You read this later. Isaiah 53. Say, preacher God don't hate sin. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. He loves a sinner, but he hates sin. If you want to see the full wrath of God on sin, read Isaiah 53. Jesus Christ hung on a cross, and there is a vivid picture of what sin will do in somebody's life. He hung on a cross. He took the payment for my sin. He took the payment for your sin. He took the payment for the sins of the world, and he was beat to a bloody pulp. One place says he was so beat that his veggies would mark. That means you couldn't even tell he was a man. Why? He didn't do anything wrong. You did. I did. What you need to do as a lost person is you need to come to the realization that it, Jesus died because of you. If you're lost and you're watching tonight, your sins kill Jesus Christ. Say, brother, you don't need to make it personal like that. Yeah, I do. Because you need to make it personal so you can be saved. You need to understand, he died in love for you and me. Don't substitute feelings for facts. The facts are this. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. And if you'll come to him when he calls, he'll save you. Let's go on. Religions today want to dismiss hell, sin, salvation by grace, the virgin birth, and the inspiration of Scripture. You know, you ever wonder why they attack Scripture so much? They attack the Scripture because when the Scriptures are preached and taught, in the Spirit of God, they convict people because God blesses his word. Isaiah 55, 11 says God's word will go forth and it will accomplish the purpose he set for it to do. You ever sat under the preaching of, or the teaching of the word of God and, and, and felt like the preacher or the teacher was talking right at you? That's the Spirit of God trying to tell you there's a need in your life and you need to fix it. Now, we'll do that and, and when they'll give an altar call, Say, Brother Rick, I can't come to an altar call. I'm at home. Well, watch this. You can make an altar right where you're at. You can kneel in your house and you can call on God. See, it ain't important about where the altar's at. It ain't even important if it's an altar or not. What's important is that you bow your heart before God and you call out to God in repentance and you ask God to save you if you're lost and to forgive you if you've gotten away from him. The Bible says in Genesis or in Genesis 4, 5 through 7, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. God wouldn't accept it. God only accepts those that come his way. Cain was mad, his countenance was fallen. The Lord said unto Cain, Why are you mad? Why is your countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Don't substitute feelings for facts. Last of all, I want to show you this and we're done. Cain substituted persecution for persuasion. What are you saying, Brother Rick? God tried to talk to him in verse 7. God tried to deal with him in verse 7. God tried to reason with him in verse 7 to come and be saved and, and offer a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. And he even told him, if you'll do what I ask you to, I'll accept you. And Cain's response was, in verse 8, as he talked with Abel, listen, Cain's issue, you need to hear this, folks. Cain's issue was not with Abel. Cain's issue was with God. But he blamed it on Abel. Why did he blame it on Abel? Because Abel's life convicted him of the life he was living. Can I tell you something, Christian? If you live right before God and before a lost world, your life's going to convict people of their life. And you may get some persecution. I've said this before, and when I said it before, 
I didn't realize it as much as I do now, but persecution's coming to the church. And it's just around the corner. And some of y'all watching tonight may think, well, Brother Rick don't know what he's talking about. You just watch the news. You pay attention to what's going on in the world. It's coming. It's coming. Are you going to be able to stand? Now watch this. Substitute persecution for persuasion. Rather than yield to the conviction of God, he turned on his brother. Isn't that amazing? In the most horrid way that the first murder in the Bible was a brother killing his brother. That's awful. Family killing family. Why? Because Abel was righteous and Cain wasn't. Watch this. His religion, you need to hear this, his religion was so refined that he couldn't offer a blood sacrifice. But it wasn't too refined to shed his own brother's blood. What a contradiction. Do you see the picture? Sin, blood was shed, but instead of accepting the blood of the sacrifice that God asked him for, he killed his brother. Why did he do that? Because he thought if he could do away with his brother, the thing that convicted him daily, he'd be okay. I, I see people do this all the time. You say, hey, you know, because when I was lost, I'd done the same thing. They'll listen to religious broadcasts. They'll watch a religious service or they'll go to church and the Holy Spirit of God be dealing with them. And here's what you think. You grab the pew, think, if I can just get out of here this morning, I'll come back tonight and get saved. That's a lie of the devil trying to get you out of church. If you're watching by TV tonight and you're thinking, I wouldn't get saved, but I'll just put it off. There's places recorded in Scripture where people did that. I'll get saved when I have a convenient time. There's never a record of them being saved. Satan never tells you not to get saved. He just tells you to put it off. Because he knows if he can get you to put it off, you probably won't do it. Watch this. There's two reactions when people hear the word of God. Two reactions and I'm done. And this holds true from Genesis to Revelation, the whole truth of the Lord comes. You've heard the word of God tonight, and there's two reactions you're going to have. You're going to have one or two reactions. One place in Scripture, in the book of Acts, the Bible says people were cut to the heart when they heard the word of God. You know what that means? This speaks of those who hear and reject the word of God. They usually then turn on the one by whom the word of God was spoken to them. And that's what happened with Abel. He lived a life in front of Cain, and Cain saw it, and it cut him to the heart, and he killed his brother. The other thing the book of Acts also says, the word of God pricks people in their heart. When it talks about pricking you to the heart, those are the ones it speaks of who hear the word of God. They receive the message of God, even though it is a message that says they're sinners and they're lost and on their way to hell, or they've got sin in their life and they're broken fellowship with God, and they'll repent, and they get things right with God back in fellowship, or they get saved. I'm going to ask you this, and I'm done. Which way are you on? Are you in the way of Cain? Are you in the way of Abel? Because the way of Abel is the way of Jesus Christ. The way of Cain is the way of Satan in the legion of hell. Which one are you on? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Fathers, we come to you right now. I want to thank you for this day and the blessing of life. Thank you for the message. Father, I pray if there'd be somebody watching tonight that did under conviction, Father, never been saved, I pray you'd help them to bow right where they're at and be saved. I pray you'd help them turn their heart and their life over to you. God, help them to call somebody and tell them and let us know. Call Brother Joel. Call me. Let us know they've been saved. Father, if one of your children's watching, they've got sin in their life and they've somehow gotten away from you, God, and you, by the word of God, have convicted them of that. Father, help them to repent and reclaim that fellowship with you, Father, and live for you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.